You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. Folks, let's go back to Capitol Hill. Today, the head of the D.C. National Guard, compelling testimony that explains exactly what happened on January 6th and who chose not to give him the right orders to uh, muster the National Guard. But listen to what he says, what they said to him when Black Lives Matter protested in D.C. Watch this. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the events of January 6th, a dark chapter in our nation's history. I was personally sickened by the violence and destruction I witnessed that fateful day and the physical and mental harm that came to U.S. Capitol Police officers and Metropolitan Police Department officers, some of whom I met with later that evening, and I could see the injuries that they sustained. It is my hope that the recollection, my recollection of the events and my presentation of the facts as I know them will help your committees in its investigation and prevent such tragic events from ever occurring again. First, I think it's critical to understand what the District of Columbia National Guard mission was on January 6th to include the civilian agency we were supporting and our request for support of other civilian authorities were handled. On December 31st, 2020, the District of Columbia National Guard received written requests from the District of Columbia Mayor, Muriel Bowser, and her Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, Dr. Christopher Rodriguez. The request sought National Guard support for traffic control and crowd management for planned demonstrations in the district from January 5th through January 6, 2021. After conducting mission analysis to support the district's request, I sent a letter to the Secretary of the Army, Ryan McCarthy, on January 1st, requesting his approval. I received that approval in a letter dated January 5th, granting support to the Metropolitan Police Department with a, a 320 guardsmen personnel to include a 40 personnel quick reaction force. The District of Columbia National Guard provides support to the Metropolitan Police Department, the United States Park Police, the United States Secret Service, and other federal and district law enforcement agencies in response to planned rallies, marches, protests, and other large-scale First Amendment activity on a routine basis. A standard component of such support is the stand-up of an off-site quick reaction force, an element of guardsmen held in reserve with civil disturbance response equipment, helmets, shields, batons, etc. They are postured to quickly respond to an urgent and immediate need for assistance by civil authorities. The Secretary of the Army's January 5th letter to me withheld that authority for me to employ a quick reaction force. Additionally, the Secretary of the Army's memorandum to me required that a concept of operation be submitted to him before the employment of a quick reaction force. I found that requirement to be unusual, as was the requirement to seek approval to move guardsmen supporting the Metropolitan Police Department to move from one traffic control point to another. At 1.30 p.m. on January 6, we watched as the Metropolitan Police Department began to employ officers to support the Capitol Police. In doing so, the officers began to withdraw from the traffic control points that were jointly manned with District of Columbia Guardsmen. At 1.49 p.m., I received a frantic call from then Chief of United States Capitol Police, Stephen Sun, where he informed me that the security perimeter of the United States Capitol had been breached by hostile rioters. Chief Sun, his voice cracking with emotion, indicated that there was a dire emergency at the Capitol, and he requested the immediate assistance of as many available National Guardsmen that I could muster. Immediately after that 149 call, I alerted the U.S. Army senior leadership of the request. The approval for Chief Sun's request would eventually come from the Acting Secretary of Defense and be relayed to me by Army senior leaders at 5.08 p.m., about three hours and 19 minutes later. I had already had guardsmen on buses at the armory ready to move to the Capitol. Consequently, at 5.20 p.m., less than 20 minutes, the District of Columbia National Guard arrived at the Capitol and were being sworn in by the United States Capitol Police. 
We help to establish the security perimeter at the east side of the Capitol to facilitate the resumption of the joint session of Congress. In conclusion, I am grateful for the guardsmen from the 53 states and territories who supported the District of Columbia National Guard Operation Capital Response and helped to ensure a peaceful transition of power on January 20th. In particular, I am grateful for the timely assistance from our close neighbors from Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland National Guard who augmented D.C. National Guard forces in establishing the security perimeter. I am honored to lead these citizens, soldiers, and airmen. These are your constituents, many of whom left, their, left behind their families, careers, their education, their businesses to help ensure the protection and safety of the United States Capitol and those who serve in it every day. General Walker, I want to start my questioning by going back in time a little bit prior to the events on, uh, on uh, January 6th. So my question is, in June of 2020, as violence was escalating during the summer protest, were you able to immediately receive approval from the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of Defense to deploy National Guard to assist law enforcement at that time? Senator Peters, I was. Yes, sir. The Secretary of the Army was with me for most of that week. He came to the armory. Uh, I was in constant communication with him when, he, when we were not together. So you were immediately able to, to, uh, to receive approval in June of 20. From your testimony, I want to be clear, you were, were, were you able to immediately receive approval from the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of Defense to deploy the National Guard on January 6th? No, sir. In your opening remarks, uh, you said uh, uh, that a January 5th memo uh, was unusual. Could you explain to the committee why it was unusual and what was the impact of the memo that you received on January 5th? So the memo was unusual in that I was, it, re, it required me to seek authorization from the Secretary of the Army and the Secretary of Defense to um, essentially even protect, protect my guardsmen. So no, no um, civil, dis, civil disturbance equipment could be authorized unless it was, came from the Secretary of Defense. Now, the Secretary of the Army, to his credit, did tell me that I could have um, force protection equipment with the guardsmen. So we did uh, have helmets, um, shin guards, um, vest. We did have that with us, but that came from the Secretary of the Army. The Secretary of Defense told me I needed his permission to, to um, escalate, to have that kind of protection. That kind of protection even though you would be engaged in force protection, that to protect your, your men and women, before you could do that, you would have to get approval from the Secretary of Defense? The, the memo from the Secretary of Defense uh, made clear that I needed his permission to, to have, um, so what it says, uh, without my uh, personal authorization, the District of Columbia National Guard is not authorized the following, to be issued weapons, ammunition, bayonets, batons or ballistic protection equipment such as helmets and body armor. Now, again, to, to be clear, the Secretary of the Army told me to go ahead and issue that equipment. So we never were going to have weapons or ammunition, and we no longer have bayonets. But we do have a ballistic protection equipment, helmets, body armor. And um, so I did have that with each guardsman. Thank you, General. Uh, General Walker, if the restrictions on your authorities hadn't been put in place by DOD, what would you have done when Chief Sun called you at 149 on January 6th with an urgent request for National Guard assistance? I would have immediately pulled all the guardsmen that were supporting the Metropolitan Police Department. They had the gear in the vehicles. I would have had them assemble in the armory and then get on buses and go straight to the armory and report to the, the most ranking Capitol Police officer they saw and take direction. And, and further, just let me add this. So one of my lieutenant colonels on his own initiative went to the Capitol anticipating that we were going to be called. So he would have been there and he met with Deputy Chief Carroll of the Metropolitan Police Department who asked him, where is the National Guard? How come they're not here? And this colonel said, well, I'm sure they're coming. 
and I'm here to scout out where they're going to be when they get here. So that was the plan. I would have sent them there immediately. As soon as I hung up, my next call would have been to my subordinate commanders, get every single guardsman in this building and everybody that's helping the Metropolitan Police remission them to the Capitol without delay. This, y'all, was an absolute inside job. There's no way around this, Monique. None. No, none at all. I, I'm I'm left speechless. I, I I don't. I hope that Americans are hearing this testimony. Um, I, I believe that from the the very beginning, from the day that I was here on the show, that all of it took place, which was January sixth. But it's just plain now. I mean, there's. There's no arguing that, and and they need to dig and dig until every single person responsible is held accountable. It, it was interesting, Scott, to listen to Republicans ask questions of the commander, knowing damn well that if a Democrat in the White House had done that, they would be raised in holy hell and losing their minds. You don't trust the troops. You don't value cops. A cop died. One had lost three fingers, one lost his eye, and these folks act like there was a picnic on the lawn January 6th. Oh, oh, very reserved, of course. But if those are a thousand Black Lives Matter, people who had gotten shot and laid out in front of the Capitol, which they would have been had, it, had they been Black folk, you would have said it was necessary, those same Republicans, it's necessary to protect democracy and our liberty and our freedom of the capital. But let me tell you something for your viewers, because uh, I've done a lot of internal investigation, okay? You don't just look at documents. You don't just interview the lead people. You go up and down that line, Roland, until you get to the link, the witness that is going to link the communication, because it won't be in writing, the stand-down communication. Somebody willing to come forward and tell the truth that the Department of Defense and Homeland Security were told to delay, stand down, and that regardless of violence, that they were certainly not to be there in order to prevent, quote, bloodshed. And that is an order that came directly from the White House. And if you investigate it long enough, if you set up the commission, you hire outside counsel, and you're really thorough because you want to know the truth, that's what the ultimate report will say. It won't be conspiracy theorists. It'll be factually based. And then that needs to be published, right? And then the bad actors need to be prosecuted. Because you're just scratching the surface based on the testimony, the public testimony. They need to go behind closed doors with hundreds of witnesses until you get to the link that we have not heard. The actual witness that says, I was in the room when the order to stand down from the White House came in. It's coming. Just sit tight. Um, Robert, to sit there and watch uh, co-conspirators ask questions is pretty funny and pretty ballsy. Well, well absolutely. And I, I think it, any banana republic on earth, and I don't like that antiquated phrase, uh, would understand that certain people need to recuse themselves from these hearings. The people who need to recuse <laughs> themselves are the people who are the co-conspirators uh, in the crime which took place. And frankly, these are the people who are going to be facing not just expulsion from the Senate, but maybe criminal charges. People like Hawley and Cruz, uh, we heard the uh, the statements from Congress, people saying that there was a congresswoman who was tweeting out the location of the Speaker of the House during the insurrection, um, the individuals, which is very easy to find, the individuals who were giving guided tours throughout the Capitol at a time where guided tours were banned at the Capitol, and those people later on uh, coming forward. We've seen the QAnon shaman say that he is willing to come forward and testify uh, as to their connection. Alex Jones has said he wants to go before a Senate committee on these issues. So the truth is going to come out. But you're right, there is a special level of gumption that's required for Hawley and some of these others to sit there and try to mm -hmm. question what happened, uh, the witnesses. And, you know, there's a uh, there's a quote from Voltaire that I like where he says, if you can convince a man of absurdities, you can force him into atrocities. And that, 
that is what we're seeing with these uh, Republicans in these MAGAs now. They've been so corrupted, so uh, bought into this idea of voter fraud and losing their country. And this goes far back before Trump. David Duke was talking about this in the 80s, the singularity that's coming in the 2040s, uh, mm -hmm. where there will be a majority minority nation, that they are so willing to believe those absurdities that they were willing to commit the very atrocities that they thought they were going to, uh, that they were going to prevent going forward. We saw the golden uh, statue at CPAC. Uh, CPAC. These people are on a completely different wavelength, and to think that we're going to go back to negotiating with them like it's uh, Tip O'Neill and uh, Ted Kennedy or something along those lines is not realistic. We have to fight the fight that's in front of us, and right now we have to fight with every weapon we have. Um, yeah. Look, yeah. Th these people... Well, one other thing, go ahead. I may, that the, the, the that witness list has got to include those House of Representatives and those senators mentioned by my colleague. They've got to put them on their own. The question is, do the Democrat, they hold on to leadership, have the, the, the guts and the fortitude to put them on their oath as well? They should. Well, um, look, these fools haven't stopped. They're not going to stop. All right, folks, back to that my unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it, please do because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.